Good evening, everyone. My name is Bill Hall. And I'm president of the World Affairs Council of Maine. And I want to welcome you to a very, very special program that we have tonight with the subject being Afghanistan and all the events that are surrounding what's going on in that country, including our withdrawal and the attacks that we've seen not only on the people of Afghanistan, but also our soldiers there as well. So this is a very special program. It's the beginning of our fall program series. Uh, the program series is called Our Changing Global Landscape, Issues That Matter. And to say that Afghanistan is an issue that matters is clearly an understatement, as recent events have the potential to define the global landscape for years to come. We are fortunate tonight to have the opportunity to hear from one of America's most experienced and distinguished diplomats, Ambassador Ryan C. Crocker, who was persuaded to join us this evening, thanks to our new board member and equally distinguished diplomat, Ambassador David D. Pierce. Ambassador Pierce served with, the ambas with Ambassador Crocker as the U.S. Assistant Chief of Mission in Afghanistan, as well as serving as the U.S. Ambassador to Algeria and to Greece, and the U.S. Consul General and Chief of Mission in Jerusalem. Before joining the Foreign Service, Ambassador Pierce was a journalist covering, among many other things, the Civil War in Lebanon. A Maine native and a Chevrolet and Bowdoin graduate, Ambassador Pierce is also an accomplished painter. We're truly privileged to have him on our board. David, before I turn things over to you, I want to thank our sister councils who are participating in this event tonight, particularly in New Hampshire and Tennessee, and who helped us get the word out about this special event, as well as to our sponsors and our donors. And I want to mention to our sponsors and donors that we'll be sharing your generosity with organizations supporting the Afghani community here in Maine. Finally, I wanna thank our audience in general, and it's quite a large audience tonight, I might add, for being here. We'll be taking your questions through the Q&A function, so look for the Q&A function on your screen or through the chat box, and you can submit them at any time. David, Ambassador Pierce, over to you. Well, thanks for that uh, introduction, Bill, and uh, thanks, of course, to Allison Hodgkins for all her hard and fast work in putting all this together. Uh, I'm very honored to welcome Ambassador Crocker to the World Affairs Council of Maine. I, I doubt he needs much introduction, but I'll just note that he certainly is one of the most senior and highly decorated foreign service officers of his generation. It was my privilege to serve with him and learn from him, not only in Kabul, but also in Syria and Washington and Baghdad. Um, I always had to call him Mr. Ambassador, but now that we're retired, I can call him Ryan. So with you, his- you Love me worse. <laughs> no, of course not. Anyway, uh, Ambassador Crocker is uh, Ryan is now a non-resident senior fellow at the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace, and he's talking to us from Spokane, Washington. Uh, he's been very involved in evacuations, uh, as you can all imagine, over the last few days. So um, we're going to be discussing some of the possible consequences of the current turbulence we're seeing in Afghanistan, but there. There are so many ramifications, it's hard to know where, where to begin. So Ryan, welcome. Thanks very much for having me, Dave. Great to connect to you again. As I recall, um, our uh, involvement together on Afghanistan started on September 11, 2001. You and I took a 0800 US Airways shuttle flight from uh, Washington to New York. And when we approached uh, Manhattan, one of the towers was on fire. Um, we flew in, second tower hit. We uh, actually were on a bridge over the East River and watched both of the towers come down from there. And then we had a long somber ride back to Washington. And I recall that you um, immediately made the connection with the assassination two days before of Ahmad Shah Massoud. Yeah, yeah, hardly a household name then or now, uh, but for us uh, uh, foreign affairs junkies, uh, Ahmed Shah Massoud was the leader of the Northern Alliance, uh, primarily uh, Tajik and Uzbek, uh, that held on to the uh, northeastern corner of Afghanistan. The Taliban were never uh, 
uh, really able to take the whole country. The line was drawn um, roughly through Bagram Air Base uh, north of Kabul. Uh, and he had been assassinated by um, elements posing as a Moroccan TV crew there to interview him. And the day it happened, I, I couldn't make sense of it. Why, why would, uh, why would Al-Qaeda go to that extremity? And then we had 9-11 and we knew um, that, uh, the, uh, that Al-Qaeda and presumably the Taliban realized that we would uh, not take that sitting down, that we would be after them. And they wanted to take the most effective field commander uh, against them off the field. Uh, and that to me, as much as anything, showed me the depth, breadth, and intensity of Al-Qaeda planning for the 9-11 attacks. Well, so we did go into Afghanistan um, uh, less than a month after 9-11. Uh, in fact, it was on October 7, 2001. And I know because I happened to be in charge of the uh, state ops Afghan task force uh, that, that night when hostilities began. And not long after that, the Taliban were out and you went back to reopen our embassy. So what was that like in 2002? Well, it was, it was interesting. Um, David and I are uh, both creatures of the State Department's Near East Bureau. Um, uh, the Foreign Service is uh, a very, very small service. Uh, it gets even smaller because we tend to uh, divide ourselves into tribes. Uh, and we were part of the Near East tribe, uh, the Near East not covering Afghanistan. That was South Asia Bureau just down the hall. And uh, we used to ask ourselves after 9-11, um, God, when are they going to get the embassy open? I mean, if this were an NEA, uh, we would have opened it on day two um, after the Taliban defeat. Uh, and we couldn't quite figure it out. So the day after Christmas, I'm Deputy Assistant Secretary uh, for the entire Middle East because all of my colleagues uh, in the front office were enjoying their Christmas holidays. Uh, I get called up to the deputy secretary's office, um, uh, Rich Armitage, uh, who said in his usual warm, avuncular fashion, Crocker, I need you to get to your, I need you to get your ass out to Kabul like the day after tomorrow, open the embassy and get things run. Um, I, I bargained with him and I, I got until like the 3rd of January. Um, and then that's what I did. Uh, it was Pretty amazing. We landed at Bagram, Kabul airport was closed. Um, uh, the road, the drive down, the hour long, hour and a half drive from Bagram was through fields of mud, uh, uh, blown up bridges, uh, no sign of, of any life, uh, human or animal, all the way into the city. Utter devastation. And the city itself looked like Berlin, 1945. Uh, whole city blocks just leveled. We didn't do that. The Taliban didn't do that. The Soviets didn't do that. The Afghans did it to themselves in, the, uh, uh, in their civil war. So uh, if ever there was a country starting from ground zero, it would have been Afghanistan 2002. Well, I, that's what I was hoping you were gonna describe because um, I wanted to sort of set a baseline for from where we started. Um, which was, you know, a flat line. And, um, and I say that because uh, now we have people, many people say, oh, it was, it was all for nothing. It was a waste. And yet, um, and, you, and you opened the embassy, not only opened the embassy in 2002, but you went back again 10 years later when our presence went, it was at its height. And um, so I'm wondering, you know, to those who say, we had no objective, we had no strategy, we didn't get anything done. How would you sum up what we were trying to do for those 20 years? Well, it, it's a great point, David, and it uh, highlights, uh, I think, the real meaning of what we're seeing now uh, as the Taliban have returned. Uh, you know, unlike Iraq, where we also both served and were present at the creation, uh, there was never any doubt about why we were in Afghanistan. Uh, 
Uh, we were in Afghanistan because of 9-11, uh, not to build nations, uh, not to make people happy, uh, but for America's core national security, uh, that never again would an adversary uh, have the time, space, and security to launch an attack on the United States homeland uh, out of Afghanistan. Indeed, uh, we gave the uh, Taliban a, a chance after 9-11, saying to them that uh, if they would uh, hand over Al-Qaeda to us, we would leave them alone. Uh, they chose to protect Al-Qaeda and began their uh, two decades in exile. So throughout that period uh, in 2002, for me, 10 years later as ambassador there, uh, uh, the core goal, again, was never in doubt. It was American national security. Things like nation building, uh, starting with schools, starting with girls' schools, um, all fed into that, that the, um, the best guarantee we could have of a secure and stable Afghanistan was in Afghanistan that worked and uh, as a nation and as a people and an educated population is clearly part of that. Um, January 02, again, uh, uh, a um, secure, a, a United States Senator from the obscure state of Delaware uh, named Joe Biden was uh, my first congressional visitor. And I took him to see a girl's school in uh, Kabul that USAID had already stood up uh, and explained to him the logic to, we had to take the long view. Uh, we had to see what we could do to produce a, an educated population that would never even think of things that uh, like the Taliban. Uh, but that takes time and America isn't really good at strategic patience. I was listening uh, to the BBC, I think it was this morning and, uh, uh, and there were a uh, World Health Organization official was talking about the casualties that were coming in. And uh, the interesting thing was that the places where they were being treated, Wazir Akbar Hospital and um, uh, an emergency and Italian NGO, these two I think took the most uh, casualties. Um, they were, they were uh, supported by the international community. They were supplied by, by us. And it just made me think about how the level of access to healthcare had been, had been raised, uh, not only there, but in the north of the country too. I remember in Badakhshan going up there and, and hearing about the, the work that had been done way up by the border with Tajikistan. And then a press and a parliament and never mind respect for human rights. Um, and, and a whole new generation. Uh, American University of, uh, of Afghanistan. Of course, there were a lot of problems with cronyism and, and, and corruption and the like, and it was a struggle all the way along. But I just keep thinking back to what your description of 2002 and where they had come and, and, and now where they may be going. Um, it's just, uh, it seems a, a, a pretty bleak perspective. Yes, and again, that, uh, that baseline, I, I got to Kabul maybe 10 days after Hamid Karzai arrived from the Bonn uh, conference that uh, named him the uh, chairman of the Afghan interim authority. He had nothing to work with, absolutely nothing. Uh, uh, no police, no army, uh, no functioning infrastructure or institutions. Um, uh, I, I went to visit a hospital in, that, in, in the month of January following a, an operation against um, Al Qaeda up in the Northeastern mountains. Uh, to visit some of the Afghan wounded um, that had fought with us in that uh, effort, they had nothing. I mean, in many cases, they were simply lying on the floor, not even a bed. Uh, you know, so when you, you go forward 10 years, we went from 900,000 students, all boys, uh, uh, at 9-11 to uh, over 8 million, 35% of whom were girls. Now, that's generational change for the better. It just takes time. Uh, to take root and grow. And unfortunately, President Trump and President Biden uh, were not prepared to um, spend that much time. Well, the, um, of course, we have to 
hope that there won't be a civil war, but uh, you know, I, it's just that how I don't see how the war doesn't continue if there's no political accommodation. Um, it looks like it's just going to be entering a new and different phase, uh, TBD. It, it is, and again, the historical background is is important because it uh, helps to explain um, how regional states view this and how they react and so forth. But uh, I, I think some things are are already very clear. Uh, the Taliban now has hold of a narrative that runs something like. Uh, um, we are God's chosen strugglers. Our, our only armor was the true faith. And in the armor of the true faith, we vanquished the great infidel, the United States of America. Uh, this is a, a huge, huge morale boost to radical groups that clad themselves in um, their version of Islam. Uh, all around the region and beyond are inspired by what has just happened. Uh, that is something for which our children and our grandchildren are going to pay. Uh, just, just look immediately next door, Pakistan, country of 220 million people and nuclear weapons. Um, they had been uh, I was ambassador there for three years, 2004, 2007. And the Pakistani refrain was consistent. Um, very happy to help us against Al Qaeda, but uh, they remember what we did at the end of the 1980s when working with Pakistan uh, and others, uh, a um, anti-Soviet jihad basically expelled the Soviet Union from Afghanistan. For us, mission accomplished. We're done. We could see the civil war coming, as you note, uh, David. Uh, the only thing that uh, had prevented it was a common enemy, the Soviet Union. Once they were gone, the Afghans would turn on each other. And they did with a vengeance, as I, I noted earlier. Uh, so the Pakistani line after 9-11 was, uh, glad you're back. Glad you're bringing your economic and uh, security assistance with you. Um, Happy to help with Al Qaeda, but if you think we're going to turn the Taliban, Afghan Taliban, into our mortal enemy, you're completely nuts because we know what you'll do. Uh, you'll get tired and you'll go home. Well, they were right. Uh, and they probably had about 15 minutes of um, high fiving in the corridors of power in Islamabad before reality set in uh, that they were now going to face. Uh, a, an, an invigorated, um, committed, and capable uh, insurrection of their own, um, the Pakistani Taliban, so-called. Uh, uh, they are not the Afghan Taliban because they have a different goal. They have as a goal the overthrow of the government in Islamabad. So watch that space uh, in, the, um, in the months ahead. Uh, I think you're going to see an uptick and violence in Pakistan that the government won't be able to prevent or completely control. And an already shaky state is going to get a lot shakier. And again, as a state with nuclear weapons. Well, uh, and I think, you know, just as with 9-11, the, uh, the fall of Afghanistan to the Taliban and the perception of a defeat for America is, is bound to have, uh, again, profound and long-term consequences that really we can only uh, guess at. So I guess in terms of looking at the repercussions and the consequences, there seem to me to be two basic sets of problems. One of them is immediate and the other one is uh, some of the ones you've already alluded to over the longer term. So if we look at the immediate problem set first, uh, the pullout, our pullout and our allies, it's gonna be all done on Tuesday. Um, and it's pretty clear, I think, you know better than I do, but it appears to me that uh, the, the military has done a terrific job in getting a lot of people out. A lot of private organizations have done the same, but it's going to end and some people are gonna be left behind. So how do you see the immediate priorities there for that job? 
Well, again, it's a, it's a great way to frame it up, you know, the immediate and then the longer term. Um, well, whatever happens, uh, President Biden, not only by his decision, but by the implementation of uh, his decision in the uh, horrific manner we, we've seen unfold, uh, uh, has, uh, has stained his presidency. I don't think there can be any question about that. Uh, we will be leaving behind um, American citizens. Uh, we will be leaving behind those who directly assisted our efforts in Afghanistan. Um, the the catch-all phrase or word is interpreters, but it goes beyond that. And it wasn't just for the military, David. As you recall, we had a lot of uh, foreign service nationals uh, at our embassy who, who made things run, made things work. They were invaluable. Um, we're not even getting all of them out. And finally, uh, all of those people who, who listened to us over the years in Afghanistan, and, and here I'm thinking in particular of women and girls. We, we said, uh, you step forward, um, uh, get educated, run for political office, be a member of parliament, join the military, uh, take those steps that had been denied you under the Taliban and before, and we've got your back. Uh, which was great until we decided we didn't have their back anymore. Um, and uh, the Taliban are going to make them pay. Uh, and it is, uh, again, uh, it, it's, an, it's a stain on, on all of us. Uh, this is not how we treat people. That's not the, the, the kind of America we believe in, except that's what we're doing. Uh, so this is uh, going to... What we're looking at now is going to set uh, plant even more seeds for a future that isn't going to be very pretty, uh, not in Afghanistan and uh, not elsewhere. We're done as of August 31. Um, what's the next step? Well, you and I, David, were talking about that just before we went on here. Uh, I, I would like to see an effort made to bring in the UN uh, in a much larger capacity. Uh, Again, when, when we were there, they had a, uh, the UN had an office uh, uh, under the highly capable Stefan de Mistura um, and did a lot of good and worked closely with us in doing it. I, I would hope the UN uh, will um, uh, return to that role. The Taliban should have an interest in it themselves. And to take that back to the immediate, I, I'd like to see a conversation where by the uh, United Nations might decide to uh, use their own assets uh, to continue evacuation, to bring in um, uh, uh, aircraft under the United Nations flag, to provide convoys safely to the airport <coughs> and to get these people out. So I, I see the makings of a conversation that could produce uh, uh, some good outcomes both immediately and longer term uh, under the uh, under the United Nations flag. That, that of course, uh, strengthening the UN um, presence and mandate, of course, requires Security Council action. That requires uh, coordinating with people like Russia and, and China and India, which who I think is now on the, on the council. Um, and, and there are other things too, like the internal crisis, uh, the UN's needed for humanitarian supplies. I think that the, there's about 10 million, there were 10 million undernourished children in Afghanistan before this happened, uh, let alone with having the airport closed down. Um, so it looks to me like we have to start engaging uh, both regionally uh, but also, and, and with the uh, other countries like Russia and China and, and, and the neighbors. And how do you, you know, you can't be in, effective in Afghanistan without engaging all the neighbors, but we have uh, our relations with one neighbor, Iran, are non-existent. And with another, Pakistan, uh, are very difficult. And we, don't, I, we have a charge d'affaires there and uh, no ambassador. And uh, it seems to me there's a ton of work to do. I'd, um, wonder where they would start. But I was, I was thinking, we were discussing this earlier also, perhaps uh, an international contact group of some sort is needed. Yes. Um, 
again, I would come back to uh, the centrality of the United Nations role, uh, a role that the United Nations has uh, played before in Afghanistan uh, uh, very effectively. Uh, uh, Lakhdar Brahimi, the legendary Algerian-born uh, UN senior envoy, uh, uh, directed that process. He chaired the Bonn Conference December 2001 that produced the uh, interim authority and uh, Hamid Karzai as the chairman. Uh, so, uh, you know, one other subset of that uh, was called the Geneva Group, uh, uh, which was a forum of uh, the Germans, the Italians, the Iranians, and the Americans, again, under Brahimi's UN flag, uh, to talk about the future of Afghanistan. Uh, we were not interested in it. I didn't even know it existed. But after 9-11, we got real interested because it was a channel to the Iranians. Uh, and uh, through the fall of 01, uh, beginning of 02, we had some very productive conversations with the Iranians that we couldn't have had elsewhere. Uh, so again, it, um, I, I, for a contact group, I think it is a good idea. Uh, but I think it needs to be UN-led. Uh, you know, that, uh, that will make it easier for the Russians, presumably for the Chinese. Uh, but if the Secretary General is prepared to um, undertake such an initiative, and uh, the Secretary General is someone we've worked well with in the past, um, uh, I think that would be the way forward. Again, both um, dealing with the current emergency, but also dealing with the need for um, uh, some kind of contact group. Um, let, let, let's get them under the United Nations flag. And David, you know, I have not always been a great supporter of the United Nations. Uh, I got a t-shirt that says the United Nations, uh, we take bribes so you don't have to. Uh, but I see uh, in this particular instance, uh, a very important for, role for the United Nations, uh, should they um, be ready to assume it. Uh, and I think we can be a catalyst there as well. The Taliban should have every reason to welcome that. Um, although we don't know a whole lot about the Taliban as we just proved. Well, I was, that's where I was gonna go next. I mean, I, I totally agree on the need to uh, uh, look at how the UN role could be structured. Cause frankly, it's hard to see who else can be effective in the, at least in the short term there. Um, and the other thing about, a, the, the, before we leave that, the only other thought I had on the, international contact group idea is that um, there's, you know, there would be some benefit, I think, to having China and Russia in such a group endeavor with us so they don't break ranks and make special deals with the Taliban and, and sort of uh, it, it becomes uh, messy uh, and difficult. Be, I think it'd be a lot better if we want to influence uh, the Taliban, if the international community wants to influence the Taliban, if uh, they were able to do so in some kind of a coordinated way. Um, I had a, uh, the, before we leave uh, the immediate, uh, it seems to me the other contact issue that's immediate is the Taliban, of course. Uh, we're going to have to consider when and how we engage uh, at some point. I know Bill Burns just went there a little while ago and had some talks, uh, but otherwise it's mainly tactical operational stuff right now, and then that's going to go. Um, and meanwhile, they need assistance. The, their foreign reserves are frozen in uh, U.S. banks, I believe, and uh, the IMF has frozen disbursements. Uh, on the other hand, if they start to see sanctions and blockage um, and not able to get any assistance, then would that not encourage the uh, worst elements uh, in their group to say, you see, this is what they're like, they're out to get us and so on and so forth. So I think it's gonna be hard to calibrate that, but I'd like to see what thoughts you've got. Well, you, again, you, you, you've laid it out uh, perfectly. Nothing about this is gonna be easy. Uh, uh, as you suggest, uh, one other virtue of an active UN program and profile is that it might serve to counter the tendency we're already seeing by some states, uh, some nations, uh, uh, to engage the Taliban directly. Uh, there's a sad irony here, 
course, uh, we're not really in a great position to argue against that since uh, we were the first ones to do it. I mean, President Trump's decision to hold talks with the Taliban and Qatar without the Afghan government being present. Uh, uh, I said it at the time and I kept on saying it. Those aren't peace talks. Those were surrender discussions. We're done. Let's see how much of a pretty bow we can tie this up in, uh, but we're done. Uh, and you know, we continued those talks to the, that awful agreement we concluded, we, the United States, with the Taliban. Uh, so we're not in a great position to tell others, ah, you shouldn't, uh, don't get too close to the Taliban. For God's sake, don't recognize them. Be like us. Oh, yeah, we're the ones who started this whole thing by talking directly to the Taliban. So we've got to recalibrate. Um, I think the uh, tactical conversations we are having with the Taliban on access to the airport, uh, clearly essential. Um, uh, but it may also develop a certain amount of uh, thinking in the Taliban that, uh, yeah, we can talk to these folks if we have to. Uh, they probably just need a larger umbrella to do it under. Uh, but as, and again, I, I think uh, an intelligent uh, initiative put forward by the United Nations with our backing, uh, I think we could clear the Security Council. Uh, I don't think the Chinese would veto, and I don't think the Russians would veto either. Um, they're not in a position economically to engage in a huge bilateral effort with the Afghans. Uh, and again, given their own brutal and bloody history there, um, they would have to see a, a broader umbrella to be in their interest as well. Well, it seems to me that there, the Taliban's assistance is certainly gonna be needed at least for humanitarian relief. And uh, the way uh, these mechanisms are developed is gonna be really important to watch. Let's look at the longer term problem set. Um, of course, first and foremost, uh, at least to me, is that this appears to be the biggest shot in the arm for Al Qaeda since 9-11, uh, you know, a rallying point for uh, extremists and jihadists uh, everywhere. Uh, Al Qaeda franch franchises, you know, I saw this in Algeria with AQIM, Al Qaeda in the Maghreb. Um, what do you think that's gonna look like? Well, again, David, um, um, history can be the present and the future as well. And uh, again, it was uh, Al Qaeda in Afghanistan after East Africa, uh, thanks to our efforts, was becoming too hot a place to remain. Uh, so they uh, sheltered under the Taliban, and that's how they that's how they planned 9/11. Well, the band is back together, guys. Um, uh, the Taliban is back. Um, throughout the country. Uh, and remember, they, they chose exile for what turned out to be 20 years, rather than give up their Al Qaeda allies. Uh, so what do you think the odds are that all of a sudden, now that they control the country again, that uh, they're going to say, oh, no, we're, we're done with them. Here they are. Um, uh, send a plane and take them to, to Guantanamo. Well, that isn't going to happen. Uh, and again, this is not theoretical. This is actual. Uh, Al Qaeda under Taliban protection gave us 9 11. And uh, I'm afraid I have to tell you that I don't think they have become gentler uh, and easier with the passage of two decades. Uh, uh, we've seen them do some expedient things vis a vis the airport and access to it. Uh, that tells us nothing about their longer term. Uh, intentions. Uh, but I would pretty well guarantee you uh, the Taliban's back, Al Qaeda, Al Qaeda's back too. And that's how we got 9 11. So this is a clear and present danger, um, which is why we can't just turn off the lights. Um, uh, you know, this may seem like the culmination of a 20 year war. Heck, I mean, it's just getting started. Well, um, the other long-term, really fundamental long-term issue I wonder about is, you know, listening to the uh, reaction overseas and particularly our uh, closest allies. Um, it seems to me that there's a, 
a lot of anger there. Um, that feeling that we basically presented them with a fait accompli. Uh, you know, and our NATO partners, of course, had more boots on the ground in Afghanistan than we did. Um, and it, it just looks to me like it's going to be a, a long term project to repair relations of trust uh, with those allies. And that's, that's, that's a lot of relationships and a lot of work by my calculation. Yeah, well, you know what they say, if you're in a hole, stop digging. Um, I, I really wish the Biden administration would stop digging. Uh, you're absolutely right from, from what I can gauge. I mean, uh, the, there were no consultations uh, effectively with uh, with our NATO allies on the withdrawal decision that uh, Biden made. Um, and he is, you know, again, it, the ironies abound. Uh, uh, President Biden is using the Trump playbook. Uh, uh, you may recall how upset NATO was uh, with uh, Trump's unilateral announcement that we would cut in half our force in Afghanistan from 5,000 to 2,500, no consultation with NATO. And Biden has now done the same thing, except uh, with far graver consequences. Uh, so NATO had to, to itself to scramble to get it, uh, its nationals out. Uh, everybody was mounting these, these airlifts, uh, thanks to our unilateral decision announced unilaterally by President Biden. So we, um, we have kind of doubled the damage to NATO uh, that, that uh, Trump uh, had uh, started us on. And uh, again, the president comes to office to say, America is back globally. Uh, we value our allies. We support our alliances. We're, we're, we're back to that role of American leadership. And then the first thing he does of consequence is behave like President Trump. So it, it's gonna be really hard to win that back and again, I, I know I'm thumping this tub a lot. Uh, frankly, given our reputational damage, um, I think that's another reason the United Nations is important. They well, one can... last question before we go to the Q&A, uh, uh, Ryan, and, and that is, uh, like I said before, uh, at least in, it just seems obvious uh, all these years, uh, Afghanistan has, is, has always been hard, always a difficult place. It has a very difficult history. But it's hard to see how the war ends without some kind of genuine political accommodation. Uh, hard, hard to get, but otherwise it just goes on. Um, so what do you think? Do you think there is any prospect of that down the road? Is, is, is Taliban 2.0 going to be interested uh, in that? I mean, there are indications that Hamid Karzai and Abdullah Abdullah are talking to them, uh, you know, uh, the Panjshir Valley group is there, but um, not in a very good position. No, uh, the, the Taliban seem to have been very, very shrewd in their um, attack plans to uh, get control of the border crossings as a top priority, and then to zero in on the north, the, the traditional uh, 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 citadel of, uh, of the anti-Taliban uh, Northern Alliance. Well, as, as the Taliban have clearly shown, there is no more Northern Alliance. It may be that one will coalesce over time. Uh, but the honest truth is we don't, we don't know what's going to happen next. We don't know what the Taliban is going to do next, probably because the Taliban doesn't know itself at this point. Uh, which Taliban? Uh, are the old guys who sat in Doha going to be running the show, or is it going to be these younger commanders that we've seen sweep through uh, uh, Afghanistan and who actually carried the day? Uh, so we've got to find a way to, uh, to talk to them. Again, more importantly, we've got to find our, lend ourselves to the effort of uh, finding a broad international way of talking to them uh, and try to shape their policies going forward because uh, left to their own devices, I think it's pretty clear we're going to get the political accommodation of the grave. Um, uh, there are a lot out there, I'm sure, who wants to put um, former President Karzai and uh, Dr. Abdullah uh, into their own graves. Uh, these are acts of real courage by their part, by the way. Um, 
uh, you know, the only way, as you say, um, uh, these kinds of conflicts can only really end through some kind of political accommodation. Uh, we'll, we'll just have to see what, um, what the art of the possible is going to be. Okay. Well, uh, Allison, I think it's probably time to time for questions. Uh, questions. Uh, thank you. Thank you both. Uh, thank you, Ambassador Crocker. Thank you, Ambassador Pierce. And thank you to the audience for all these wonderful questions. It's interesting, as you guys have been talking, uh, several questions have come in related to go governance, um, how the Taliban are inheriting a country or not inheriting, have taken a country that is fundamentally different, as you pointed out, Ambassador Crocker, um, than the one that they left um, 20 years ago. There's also endemic problems in terms of things like corruption. Um, there are certainly groups that disagree with how they're going to run. And so the question that I'm seeing here is, are the Taliban actually going to be able to manage things? David. <laughs> well, I think uh, we've already seen that uh, it, the answer is probably with great difficulty. Um, they are um, essentially, they've been a, a, a rural, a movement. Um, they have not been in charge of provincial capitals until very recently. Um, they, they may have external advisors who are helping them a little bit, but uh, the fact is that in Afghanistan, uh, the urban population uh, can be quite a different uh, kettle of fish. Uh, even though the rural population is the majority, the vast majority maybe, uh, nevertheless, there is a there is a very uh, strong and thriving urban culture in, in a number of important regional uh, centers, and they're not used to doing that. And one of the points that I saw somebody making the other day was that um, uh, they're going to be in charge now. Uh, they're going to have to meet the salaries and pay the make the services happen. Uh, they're going to have to find the money. They're going to have to figure out how to do all that stuff. And, um, and, and, and we've seen today that one of the uh, extremist groups here, ISIS-K, Islamic State Khorasan, um, is not aligned with the Taliban and considers them an enemy. And they're likely to be dogging their heels and, and, and doing to them what they did to uh, the Afghan government before. Yeah, I, I think that's uh, exactly right. Um, it's, you know, again, uh, uh, the car and the dog, uh, the dog parked the car, now what? Um, uh, and again, they're not going to find um, um, a whole lot of the citizenry wholeheartedly welcoming them back, uh, remembering what they had done um, the last time they had the chance. So uh, again, um, if, if they understand anything, it's got to be that uh, governance counts. You know, David, you've and I have seen that so many times in the Middle East where uh, the root cause is so often uh, <clears throat> uh, uh, corrupt officials, institutions that don't work uh, and so forth. So uh, the, we'll, we'll see what the Taliban calculates as its best way forward. But again, stand by for that, who is the Taliban question because they're asking themselves that same question. Who, who's gonna run this particular show? I think we're right. Uh, to immediately freeze assets in um, in the U.S., uh, it it gives us some 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 bargaining capacity now that we didn't have. We well we gave up all our leverage, uh, which is why we got what we got. Uh, well, we fought a little bit back by by freezing assets, uh, and it may allow us again in concert with others to uh, try to extract some positions from the Taliban. Uh, if they see it in their long-term interest uh, to have a state that is trending in the right direction by and large. Um, and, and context is important. I mean, what the Taliban uh, got in the mid nineties, uh, uh, they were not widely opposed by the end because people were so sick of the killing and the uh, destruction that had uh, destroyed the country basically. Well, it's a different Afghanistan today. Uh, things actually do work. I talked about those 8 million kids in school, medical care, uh, which was non-existent, uh, now is very much in existence. So the Taliban have a different thing to deal with. Uh, 
And we might be able again to help shape those decisions because we got their money. Um, another question here on the relationship between the Taliban, Al Qaeda, and ISIS, um, and particularly the, some people, a lot of the commentary that we hear talks about how these groups are antithetically opposed to each other, yet I hear other journalists and other analysts talking about the fact that there's a possibility for these alliances of convenience, and the question that we have here is, is there a risk that there is going to be sort of a supergroup or a convergence between these different Sunni is Islamist groups in the future, but generally a better understanding of the relationship between Al-Qaeda, the Taliban, and ISIS. Well, let me take a whack at that, and then, Ryan, you can pile on. Um, all three of these groups um, are essentially very conservative Salafi, that is, you know, Puritan, uh, Sunni uh, ideological groups. Um, they all want to create a, uh, a, uh, an Islamic state, uh, never mind the fact that we already have an Islamic state, uh, Islamic Republic in Afghanistan, but that's their, their goal. The Taliban are Afghans. Uh, their focus is Afghanistan. They're local. They come from rural areas in the mountains. They have a rear, of course, a huge presence in the camps in Pakistan. Uh, and, and they're largely Pashtuns. And their areas of strength are the areas of the east and the south of the country. Al-Qaeda, on the other hand, um, has a much broader sort of international organization different nationalities. Um, they, uh, of course, have a special feeling for Afghanistan as the place where they were born and grew under Osama bin Laden and, and Mullah Omar uh, with the Taliban. But they have a kind of a broader international focus and they work through these franchises like Al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula and Al-Qaeda in the Maghreb and elsewhere. Um, and they are composed of people of different nationalities. Uh, they're also, they also are very well organized and um, they're pretty cosmopolitan. They're pretty high tech, uh, both in the media and in their fighting skills. Uh, and they are aligned with the Taliban. Uh, on the, on the, the last group though, uh, ISIK, uh, Islamic State Khorasan, I believe they're mainly Afghans and Pakistanis. Uh, they operate in the northeastern part of Afghanistan and northwestern Pakistan, rather northeastern Afghanistan, northwestern Pakistan. Uh, many of them are former Taliban, but they just considered the Taliban to be too uh, liberal, uh, <laughs> too moderate. They, uh, um, they criticized the Taliban for giving up jihad and negotiating with us, among other things. And they are, an, are enemies of the Taliban. So they're, they're three different groups, but there are distinct differences among them. And it, I, I understand this is being recorded. Uh, that is a great and good thing. Uh, what you will want to do is um, get your own access to the recording because that was probably the best short analysis I have heard uh, on these three groups. I, I would add a fourth that uh, David has already uh, foreshadowed. And that of course is the Pakistani Taliban uh, from whose ranks uh, it seems that Islamic State Khorasan grew. Uh, the Pakistani Taliban uh, aren't that interested in Afghanistan. They're interested in Pakistan and they're interested in bringing down the Pakistani government. Uh, so uh, I would add to the three that fourth and bear in mind, uh, my, it's my personal view and I'd love to know what David thinks. I, uh, what the Taliban were able to do um, uh, is encouraging radicals everywhere. Um, so you're gonna see the strengthening of some groups and the um, emergence of others. Uh, my, my focus and concern um, uh, in, in particular is on Pakistan and to inject a little levity into this somber discussion. Uh, there is a, a former uh, inter-services intelligence uh, uh, leader named Hamid Ghul. He was the one who used Pakistani's intelligence apparatus to strengthen and support the Taliban to end the civil war. Uh, he had a great line. He said, so um, uh, inter-services intelligence defeated the Soviet Union 
in Afghanistan with help from the Americans. Now, um, Inter-Services Intelligence uh, has defeated the Americans in Afghanistan with help from the Americans. Um, and that pretty well captures it. We did it to ourselves. So what I'd like to do now is sort of move into the region and then the broader picture. Um, actually, what I want to start with is the question of our alliances. Several people have raised the point that, you know, several uh, commenters have said that they can remember when the United States was the best ally in the world um, and the worst enemy that another country could have. Is this irrevocably lost? Um, what is going to be the long-term damage of what has happened in Afghanistan to our allies and how do we repair it? Well, oh, good. Um, okay, I'll, yes, please. <laughs> the, the answer is, uh, it's really hard. I mean, once you lose trust um, to, to replace it, to rebuild it, it's, um, I, I don't see any answer to that, except that it's gonna be a long, hard um, job. And it's gonna involve not just one or two relationships, it's gonna re involve relationships all across the board. And it's gonna take time um, because we have to basically uh, recreate uh, confidence uh, in, uh, in our word. I was, I was looking, you know, at, I don't know if anybody remembers this, but back in uh, 2012, we signed a strategic partnership agreement with Afghanistan. We also declared Afghanistan a major non-NATO ally, like Israel, like Australia. Um, the White House fact sheet for the strategic partnership agreement said that the goal has been to define with the Afghan government what's on the other side of transition and the completed drawdown of US forces. And uh, through this agreement, we seek to cement an enduring partnership that strengthens Afghan sovereignty, stability, and prosperity, and contributes to our shared goal of defeating Al Qaeda and his extremist affiliates. And when Secretary Clinton announced that Afghanistan was a major non NATO ally, she said the new status was a powerful symbol of our commitment to Afghanistan's future. And she said, we are not even imagining abandoning Afghanistan. Well, um, you have to remember that a lot of people heard all those words. And uh, a lot of people now are wondering, like British parliamentarians giving talks, uh, whether they need some kind of foreign policy other than God bless America. Well, that is a grim and accurate assessment. Um, uh, again, that's why I keep thumping the uh, UN tub. There, I think there are several other things the Biden administration could do uh, to perhaps change some perceptions. And the, the ones that come to my mind really don't have anything directly to do with Afghanistan. I think um, uh, that we should be launching a global effort that we direct and resource as necessary on COVID. Um, we, we, we've seen the appalling differences between um, the uh, advanced Western democracies and uh, effectively bankrupt countries in, in, um, in Africa and elsewhere. Uh, so an all out US effort to lead an international drive against COVID with uh, immediate focus on countries that don't have the means to inoculate their populations uh, 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 could help us reset uh, how we're seeing globally. Uh, you know, again, President Bush 43 did that on with the PEPFAR initiative uh, in Africa, and it was a highly successful policy. Uh, the second thing we can do um, that comes to my mind and has nothing to do with Afghanistan, uh, rejoin the Trans-Pacific uh, Trans Partnership. Uh, that has moved on without us. Uh, I, I would like to see the president move us back in. Uh, that will require a lot of adroit diplomacy. Uh, uh, but I think in addition to what David has said, I, I think we would want to look at initiatives like this. 
Well, speaking of initiatives and um, Asia more broadly, uh, a question here about the future role of China in Afghanistan and in terms of how is this going to impact the Belt and Road Initiative um, and particularly China's own national security concerns with regard to its Uyghur population. Um, is, is this a boon for China in terms of its ability to exert influence and is it going to have to exert influence because of its national security concerns? Well, that is a really complex and really important question, uh, which is why I defer to David. <laughs> this is becoming a pattern. You noticed. <laughs> uh, well, my, I, my thought on, on China is, um, is basically that the Chinese are, are probably uh, going to be mainly interested in stability. Uh, so it's, that raises the interesting question and, and stability because of the Belt and Road and because they see it as an important link in the chain and all of that. So that raises the question of to what extent they would be interested in an international, uh, coordinated international effort uh, to produce such stability, knowing that it's hard. Um, they're gonna be interested in the economics, of course. There's a lot of lithium in Afghanistan. There's a mountain of copper and other um, uh, minerals and rare earths, uh, which they're very interested in. Um, and uh, so I think that that's going to be their focus. They're also going to be wanting to presumably work with Pakistan, uh, another of their neighbors in, in that regard. So I expect they'll be coordinating with Pakistan and they'll be coordinating uh, in, with the international community with an eye to those things. Um, I don't know, I, and I can't guess what their thoughts would be on relations with the Taliban. I've read press reports that the Taliban are counting them on them to provide the money if the international community doesn't. You know, the only thing I could possibly add to that in the case of China was in Allison's question, what about the Uyghurs? Uh, the international community has been very vocal in our denunciations of China's treatment of its Uyghur Muslim population in the West of China. Um, uh, are we going to continue with that criticism and that pressure? Um, or will our concerns over the rising tide of Islamic militancy cause us to kind of drop the uh, temperature on that a bit? Um, uh, and that really is, uh, that is a genuine question. I don't know what we're gonna do here. Um, uh, I think there will be arguments on both sides and um, uh, I'm just not sure of the outcome. Thank you. I'm going to cheat and try and squeeze two questions into one question because we are at the time of the last question. And I do want to thank our audience for all of these wonderful uh, and informed questions. So obviously, when we're thinking about the region, we need to think about the consequences of Iran, but we also have to think about what are the long-term prospects for peace in Afghanistan. Afghanistan is a country that has multiple ethnic linguistic differences. It has north-south issues within the country. Um, what, is, what is a Afghanistan at peace going to look like? And is it perhaps going to be a different country altogether? Might there possibly be a successful succession of northern parts of, Af uh, of Af Afghanistan, which of course would also make countries like Iran uh, and China nervous as well? See, I managed to knit those together in one last question. And David well, will we'll answer it again. <laughs> Well, that's because I want you to finish up with a, a with the Iran reference, which you have special expertise on. Um, I, I, well, I, you know, we can only hope that there won't be a civil war and that there uh, eventually will be some kind of a, a, a coordinated effort to uh, get the Afghan parties together, as we are, have long tried to do an Afghan Afghan settlement, um, because that's what it's going to take to end the war. And if the war doesn't end, then bad things happen, like ungoverned spaces and terrorism and, and groups like uh, IS, uh, Islamic State, Khorasan, and so forth. I think that any arrangement in Afghanistan is going to have to end up um, playing to the nature of the place. It's, it's a very mountainous uh, place with a lot of local power centers. So it's going to have to be a decentralized arrangement um, with regional autonomy, uh, real uh, authority in, in the regions. 
and some kind of rules of the game about how that's going to work. And, and I think uh, that it's going to be really important for the international community to try and uh, not arrange that, but to help the Afghans arrange it and to provide support where they can. Yeah, um, I, I think that's right. Uh, I'm a history buff. Um, I, I would take a look at Af Afghanistan's modern history, uh, which I think most uh, scholars date to the, um, uh, the British defeat in the third Afghan war at the end of World War uh, II, or World War I, and the rise of um, uh, the, uh, the new Afghan monarchy under Amanullah Khan, uh, a very progressive leader uh, uh, in terms of his efforts to westernize Afghanistan, it eventually cost him his throne. Uh, but to look at that half century, say between 1920 um, and uh, 1973, when um, the Afghan monarchy was, uh, was overthrown, uh, that was a period of um, relative stability, maybe even more than relative stability, uh, and an economy that at least got by. Uh, throughout that period, as it will be the case going forward, Afghanistan depended on international help. Uh, so I, I would kind of dust off uh, that, uh, that half century and look for lessons that uh, the world could um, usefully support for the next half century. Afghanistan is not going away. And on that note, Bill, I'll turn it back to you. Thank you, gentlemen. Well, I just want to say this was fascinating tonight. I really appreciate it, uh, Ambassador Crocker. Ambassador Pierce, the discussion was uh, fantastic. And I love it because we sit here in Maine, that's a long way from Afghanistan. <laughs> and, but, but you know what you hear when you, when you hear this discussion tonight, you hear global connections and truly there are global connections and Maine is involved in those, whether sometimes it wants to be or not. I mean, you talked about the ramifications that the whole issue of Afghanistan has in the region. So if I think about China and Pakistan and Iran and other players, Russia even, other players in the region, what are they gonna be doing as a result of the things that are happening in Afghanistan? You also think about the uh, fact that we've had hundreds of Mainers who've served in Afghanistan. So they've gone over there and they've deployed for a year or more and they've been there. So they know what the country looks like and feels like. And I know that there, I'm a Vietnam War veteran myself, so I know, I kind of understand the feelings they might be having right now. I also wanna say that global connections might consist of, and the implications for what's happening in Afghanistan might mean new Mainers. So we may have people coming to Maine who are fleeing Afghanistan, and we certainly wanna welcome them. I think we need new Mainers. And I think if nothing else, that would be a good outcome of all of this. So again, I really want to thank you very much for being here tonight. It is a fascinating topic with all kinds of ramifications. We could have gone on till, till, till tomorrow, undoubtedly. And uh, again, it's been wonderful to hear what you've had to say about it. And I appreciate the experience that you brought to it. I want to mention too, for the, uh, for the uh, World Affairs Council of Maine, we have a coffee discussion group coming up, which should be interesting. And it'll be next week, and we'll have a Boston Globe reporter sharing that coffee discussion group with us. On a, maybe I could call it a little lighter topic. We're also going to be meeting on the 23rd. And it's an, I think it's an issue that matters, frankly, but it's going to be the story of coffee. And there are all kinds of interesting ramifications in that as well. So I think you'll find that fascinating. And then we're going to be looking at Germany. And clearly, there's something big going on in Germany. Angela Merkel is retiring. And we're going to have elections in Germany, and that's going to have an impact on Europe and probably on all of us as well. So again, thank you so much for being here tonight. And I want to thank the large crowd that we got for this program. Great to have you with us. And I want to again thank the sponsors and donors, the folks who keep us uh, going financially. That's a great help to us. And a reminder that donations, we're going to be sharing the donations with, if, if you know, hopefully if we see new Mainers coming from Afghanistan, we're going to be sharing those donations with organizations that can help them adjust to their new lives. So again, thank you very much, everybody, for being here. Allison, thank you for organizing all of this. I, I thoroughly enjoyed it. Thank you, everyone. And I wish you all a very good night. This is the end of the webinar.